Golden State Media Concepts Fantasy Football Podcast is your one-stop shop for fantasy football news and advice. Can't decide on who to draft on the first round? Going gaga on how to line up your team. Got you covered. Traditional league, dynasty league, PPR league, IDP league, IDP league, even daily fantasy football league. Join us as we break down all the questions of fantasy football. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Fantasy Football Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Hosted on the GSMC Podcast Network. I am their host every Friday, Ethan Orfe. So, hope everybody's having a wonderful day thus far. I'm having a great one. I'm ready to talk about some football, some big news. So, you know, AFC Championship game, NFC Championship game. We got some weird NFL news like Odell. Odell's been going going off the rails since the national championship game. Things are not going well for him. Uh talk about some dynasty league stuff, some uh some rankings and just looking at the how people have been looking at the grand scheme of da- uh, dynasty leagues and fantasy football. And then uh just a plethora of other stuff that we're going to get into and get around. So first of all, to let's uh hit up these AFC championship game thoughts. So Titans Chiefs that is the AFC title heavyweight match. And I mean heavyweight as in two teams with two different offensive philosophies going up against each other, which generally will mean that one of them is going to win. Well, yeah, any, well, yeah, of course, anybody's going to win one team. You can't tie in playoffs. However, what I mean is somebody's offensive philosophy is going to be better than the other and that's how this team is going to win because it's very I don't think it's possible for both the Tennessee's idea of run Derrick Henry to the ground and run down your throat and make you physically want to quit juxtaposed against you know Andy Reid's like air raid pass attack onslaught with the Chiefs is going to be the same they just can't all they can't coexist only because when you look at how they played last last uh, in, uh, in the regular season, the Chiefs beat them by three, and I don't think that's they're a different team now. So you have to respect the fact that you know Derrick Henry and the and the Tennessee Titans are completely like they've evolved game to game to game to game with this scheme of just not caring. They don't care. They don't care what you're going to throw at them. They know you're going to stack the box, and it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, they're going to do what they have been doing for the past few weeks. It's almost as if it's like seeing a stubborn college offense do what they do all the time, except for it's working. This is like when, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but when Georgia Tech, their football program, ran triple option for a solid like six years straight, right? And... It really wasn't something that worked very well. And it was really, it was getting outdated year after year after year, but they just kept running it. It was like that, but it works. Derrick Henry touching the ball 30, 30 plus times, 35 times plus is working for them. And it would be one thing if Tannehill was throwing the ball also like a balanced attack, but it's not. It's extremely skewed to the run game. And extremely skewed to Derrick Henry touching the ball like 75% of the time. So when you have something like that and it works, it's so bad for opposing teams because if they score, so let's say Tennessee gets the ball, they do their Derrick Henry uh, rushing attack and they score first drive. If... The other team doesn't score or doesn't get or doesn't get seven. They have to get seven. If they get three, it's not a good play 
because their defense is extremely underrated. Their defense is playing the best football they've had. And if they don't, if the Chiefs don't score and they give Tennessee the ball back just to go over and do it again, because all it takes is one time. All it takes is one time for the Titans to know that, oh, you can't stop us from running the ball. It's over with. In their mind, it's over. Because they just know what they can do and know what they can. That's, that's their bread and butter. They're going to mentally make you quit. It's one of the craziest things I've seen in a long time in football is where one team's philosophy is to make you mentally quit. Not, not frills, not amazing trick plays, not trickery, not uh, window dressing as the Chiefs do quite a lot, which is also phenomenal. It's just making you think, giving you so many different looks out of different formations. And then it's one thing and then ends up being another just to get some, uh, you know, get people down the field and get open bombs to like Tyreek or to um, Travis Kelsey. But they are saying, we know what you're going to do and there is nothing you can do about it. So you're just going to have to suck it up or stop us. So in the past two games, that Patriots game, they did. They just kept running Derrick Henry. They just kept running him, kept running him. The Patriots went to their Super Bowl defense because, and then you know what's crazy? The commentators predicted that they were going to do that just because that's the only way they were going to be able to stop him because that's how they stopped Todd Gurley. But clearly this is, this is a different set of tools here. This is a different set of people, my mentality. Sean McVay was not someone who was like, oh, we're going to run the football down their throat type of guys. That's what Vabril is doing right now. And he doesn't care. Try and stop us. So it's just going to be a real interesting match from that perspective, just because if the Chiefs get some, get some stops early, I don't know if Tennessee is going to be able to continue on with this mentality. So if the Chiefs get some stops on defense and all of a sudden they score maybe 14 in the first quarter, and then, or 17, they get a field goal. That's, I don't know how the Titans really come back from games like this. Now, granted, you have to give them the benefit of the doubt that they can withstand. They're in the AFC Championship game. They're pretty good. And they've probably been a top three AFC team since the last four weeks of the regular season, but they just haven't been getting enough credit. And maybe they shouldn't have beaten Baltimore last week. And Baltimore have had too much rest. And maybe Baltimore underestimated just how good the Titans actually are and how sound they are within their scheme. And really just how comfortable being themselves they are. They're not trying to do, they're not trying to play outside of their identity. And I think that's something that a lot of people have not really taken into account that when you have an identity as a football team, it can be really easy to think that you have to be something else in order to get to the next level to push on and reality you just have to refine this identity and really make it your own game after game and you have to trust the trust the vision so i think tennessee has trusted this vision all season long now and now it's starting to you're starting to see the fruits of it as you see you see players really start to shine when it's no longer thinking on the field. They're reacting. And I think now they're just starting to react more. So I'm just interested to see just how that goes. Uh, if from a fantasy perspective, which we'll get into a little bit more or like gambling or anything like that, I really don't know who the, who the big dogs are besides Derrick Henry on the, on the Titans, because as of right now, we've only seen so many passes <laughs> come out of Tannehill's hand. He only has 200 yards, pa- under 200 yards passing. In both playoff games thus far. So in reality, it's a very, very small sample size and you don't really know what his, uh, what his receivers might do. Granted, of course, you know, AJ Brown was a thousand yard receiver in the regular season. So you'd hope that he'd get some touches when it comes down to it. And, you know, of course, their secondary on the Chiefs has improved drastically and they look a lot better and their pass rushes look a lot better. But we'll just have to see because if Tennessee runs the ball like everybody expects them to, um, it's just going to be a different look 
for them. They can't just pat, rush the pass. You can't just keep sending sending blitzes because you never really know if their running game gets going. You have to be prepared for other things like the play action, and you just don't or bootlegs and stuff like that. So you don't really want to. You can't send the house as much as you would like to, or you can't, or because all it takes is just one time, and then it's a forty-four yard bomb like he threw uh, in the last game against the Baltimore Ravens, where they kind of sold out on the run and they got one-on-one coverage in uh, back of the end zone. It was just a dart, so you just never really know. So, so we're gonna come back into the next segment with some NFC championship game talk. And then after that, we're going to get into some fantasy players to look at as far as big spending, little spending. We're going to get into that after the break. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines, they got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. All right, so before we were talking about the AFC Championship game, and now we're going to get into the NFC Championship game, which would be the Green Bay Packers versus the San Francisco 49ers. And they've played earlier in the regular season, and we can use that as a sample size, but I feel like the 49ers are a different team right now, and so are the Green Bay Packers because... When you play more games down the season, you start to figure out just what you are. And then, you know, the injuries and schemes are changing ever so slightly. You know, things are different now. So what has remained constant is what teams really look at and see what how to stop individuals from having big games. And I think the the key for a lot of these teams uh, that have been trying to stop Green Bay, of course, is to keep their running game kind of down. So whenever Aaron Jones has a subpar day, Green Bay doesn't look like the same, uh, the same balanced attack. And that can get them in trouble a bit. Uh, it's been stated a lot through sports media and all that about Aaron Rodgers being a little bit, uh, being a little bit underwhelming or maybe he's just not the same A Rod as he was beforehand. And, I mean, you can kind of physically see it. He doesn't look as the same. I guess he doesn't look like the best quarterback in the league anymore. And that's not a knock. That's just how life works. You know, he's getting older. Just as everybody else who in the league who is getting older, they start their play starts to deteriorate a bit. They're not as sharp. They can't make all the throws that they could in their prime. And he's still, he's not out of his prime, in my opinion. He's still there. He's like at the tail end. But... He can still play and he can still play at a high level and he could turn it on. It just not won't be, it just can't be on all game for him. And that's why someone like Aaron Jones in their running game and Jamal Williams and all that is just so imperative for them to get it going. But that's, that's hard to be said against a 49ers defense who has really been figuring some stuff out, especially after the bye week that they had in the first round. They um they needed that rest and now they're really starting to get things together. Um they stopped the team in the Vikings that is already predicated on the run and very dedicated to doing that. And they just stopped Dalvin Cook straight up. It was not any there wasn't any big play ability coming out of that offense anymore. And after that first touchdown they gave up to the Vikings, 
it just seemed like they figured it out and they knew what to do and they just dominated for the rest of the time. Uh, the 49ers showed that they're a class above some teams in the NFL and they really flexed their muscles that day on why it's not a crazy idea that they're the best team in the NFL, not let alone the, the NFC. So you got to be able to establish your offensive identity against them before things get really settled or else they might just swallow you up on defense. And then that's when they are at their most dangerous because if they can stop your offense and they know your defense is good, but is not fit to go for a war of attrition, you know, they'll just, they'll just tear you apart piece by piece. They'll run the ball They'll pass the ball. They're very balanced. So they're a balanced attack. And then if they get a few points on the lead, they'll just run it down your throat. And they'll just eat clock, eat clock, eat clock, because they just know they have 100% faith into their defensive scheme and their uh, personnel that you just won't be able to do anything against them because they know you'll be one-dimensional and you won't be able to pass against their secondary. So... You have to be able to establish your offensive identity on your first drive against the 49ers to make them respect you in a sense. So it's kind of weird when you look at it from when they played the Seahawks, how, you know, that game was a bit weird just because there are some weird penalties going on. And, then, uh, you know, when you're Russell, Russell Wilson is so good that you can really see a difference between how a team's philosophy is when you have someone like him. And someone like DJ DK Metcalf rather than someone who is Kirk Cousins and also has really good receivers. But they're, you can see that they attack things differently and some things work against the 49ers while others don't. But the Seahawks really couldn't run the ball at a certain point because their bell cows were hurt. Uh, Chris Carson was hurt earlier near the tail end of the season. And, you know, they picked up Marshawn, uh, Mike Turbin, and, you know, it wasn't the same. And it wasn't something that they could do consistently. And they had to really rely on Russell Wilson making plays and getting it down the field. And they couldn't sack him, really. And that's not a, a knock against Kirk Cousins because Russell Wilson is a evasion artist when it comes to dancing around the pocket, being able to make people miss, and really just break loose all the time. There are just times when Russell Wilson should go down and he just does not. His pocket awareness is nothing short of elite. So, and that goes back to Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers' pocket awareness is very elite as well, but his uh, his capability is not either. One is not as good as it used to be back in the day in his, in his heydays when he was really just maneuvering around and able to run out and stuff, but it's not as good as Russell Wilson's is. And that defense is really fast. The 49ers are a fast team, like really fast. So it's going to be up to Green Bay's offensive line to really get Aaron Rodgers in there comfortable and not let the pass rush of uh, Nick Bosa and them boys over there just touching him and getting, getting in his head or getting to his head, I should say, rather than getting in his head and allowing him to make the reason he's supposed to make to to make this game as competitive as it can be. As Green Bay is a team that if they don't have the lead and they have to play behind and it's kind of hard for them to claw back certain times. And the 49ers are a team that if you give them the lead, they will sit on it and they will force you to do something about it. And... A lot of teams have not been able to be successful in making making them pay for that sort of style of defense. So it's going to be really interesting to see how everything is handled. I don't know what the answer for George Kittle is on any defense and from any team. So it just looks to be like a gigantic mismatch of cross league wide is getting Rob Kronkowski levels of just nobody in the league can defend him territory if um, the 49ers, excuse me, not the 49ers, the Vikings best cover linebacker, right? 
He was voted the best cover linebacker in football. He's well known. If Eric Kendrick can't can't do it, I don't know really who can. And that just goes to say that George Kittle is the best tight end in the game. He might be the best weapon left in the playoffs, aside like not counting quarterbacks. Maybe Tyreek Hill, maybe is the best weapon. It's between it's 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 debatable. Of course, you can, you can say Derrick Henry, of course, but Derrick Henry at this point is not a weapon. He is a game plan. <laughs> so I don't really know. Uh, outside of that, I guess Tyreek Hill, just because of his ability to to just ruin defensive lives, defensive secondaries' lives, just his speed is unmatched right now. And the second fastest player in the playoffs is Hardman, who is also on the same team. So they're just it, in incredibly speed demons. They're just running all over the place. So yeah, so I would probably take Tyreek Hill, maybe. It's it's really tough, but close second probably might be first is definitely George Kittle because he's just not guardable in between the hash, in the inside, on out routes. They just use him in so many different ways. And his blocking is so key. He can block really well. And that's something that People have knocked Travis Kelsey for that he's not as good of a run blocker as uh, as he could be. So George Kittle just has the whole package right now. He just looks like a man amongst boys in a league of men. But uh, we're going to come back after this break and we're going to talk about the fantasy production people that you should look at to pick up for the last two games of the playoffs, so to speak. And see what exactly, how much you should be spending on these players. And that'll be coming up right after this. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit GSMC. GSMCpodcast.com for more info. All right, for all my daily fantasy players, this is for you. So the ones that wake up Sunday morning and panic and like, oh, man, I didn't set my daily fantasy lineup. Oh, man, I got $3. I can do something, see if I can flip this around and make my money back. Or the ones that are planning today or they were started planning yesterday about what to look at, who to look at, who might be able to have big game potential because, you know, it's all about crunching the numbers and making sure that you can afford a good team and balance out all the, I guess, the salary cap on all of that. So we're getting in there and we're going to get into the nitty gritty of all of that by talking about who is your, who are your studs that you have to spend the big bucks on. And we're going to kind of go down the list of course, there's only four quarterbacks that you can choose from. And, you know, there's the high octane Patrick Mahomes and sort of, sort of still high octane Aaron Rodgers with potential. And then there are the two more methodical, more, more game manager types in Jimmy Garoppolo and, of course, Ryan Tannehill. So, where do you go from here? Uh, you really don't... Most people's mindset, of course, would be you don't play with this section. You know who the best quarterback amongst the group is. You should pick him, right? And, yeah, that's a that's a good mindset to think about. 
but you also have to think about the matchups and what potential. If you believe that, say if you think that the Tennessee Titans are going to win, how how on earth would the Tennessee Titans win this football game? Controlling the clock, keeping the ball away from Patrick Mahomes, right? And if Patrick Mahomes is not touching the ball, he's not getting the ball down the field. Granted, you know, Lamar, he got a good amount of stats against that uh, Tennessee Titans defense. It wasn't like the Tennessee Titans shut them out outside of points. Yardage-wise, they were moving the ball on the Tennessee Titans. They just were really good on red zone defense. So they had nine out of 12 drives, I believe, the the Ravens, where they were in Titans territory. They just not could not finish set drives with a, with a score. So that's just something to put in mind. There's no way the Chiefs do something like that. So he's definitely a pickup that wouldn't be the wouldn't be the worst in the world probably would be the best case scenario and then there's a I would say that Aaron Rodgers kind of middle of the pack you don't really know 49ers defense is really good and his his performances of recent have really not been the best he hasn't had a really really good game since the Giants where he had 28 fantasy points so you really don't know just what A-Rod is going to show up or should I say what the game plan would would really take place for for Aaron Rodgers to really dominate and show what he is capable of. And then, of course, you have Ryan Tannehill, who, let's just face facts, he's not the, he hasn't had the best fantasy performances that you would like in the past few games. But, you know, he's pretty average. He gets you 18. The only game that he really didn't do anything was the, New England game where he only had like seven fantasy points. So you take that into account. He's at 18, 17, 23, 25, 28, then a 13, then a 32. And that was against Jacksonville and the 13 was against Indianapolis. So you can really see exactly where the things trend. If he feels comfortable enough to to get the football down the field. And it really just depends on if he scores, if he scores passing touchdowns, really. Uh, because if you look at the numbers, he gets, if he gets 19 passing attempts and above, uh, he'll do really well. If he doesn't get really more than 14 passing attempts, then you don't really know exactly where that's going to be at. So you don't really know what you're getting out of him unless you see the game plan. So let's also keep in mind that if he didn't get a rushing touchdown last week, his points would definitely look closer to that game against Indianapolis than it does uh, in the other game. So then there's Jimmy Garoppolo, of course, finally, as we're going to try and speed this up now since we're spending a little bit too much time on these quarterbacks. It's not that hard of a decision. Uh, Jimmy Garoppolo has had some pedestrian numbers in the past four games in the playoffs and in the last few games of the regular season. So 8, 11, 12, and 12 were those point values. And then his last big game was, of course, against New Orleans, where he probably had his best game of the year, fantasy-wise and just big game-wise. And, you know, you never really know what you're going to get out of him aside from him managing the game the best he can and following Shanahan's game plan. So what does that leave the the big the big guys? So honestly, if you wanted to roll the dice, you pick Tannehill, because I feel like he has a bit a bigger ceiling than Jimmy Garoppolo. But if you want to play it safe, pick A Rod or Patrick Mahomes and probably you spend the extra thousand five hundred on Patrick Mahomes. Uh, next we're just going to hit some skill positions. So the big, the big pulls of our Derrick Henry and Aaron Jones in the running back positions, uh, Kansas city kind of runs by committee and so does San Francisco. So you don't really want to mess with those two as your running back number ones. So whichever one is your, you know, pick your poison feast or famine, uh, Derrick Henry will get probably 70% of the touches. And 
The only thing that's different about him is he does not really catch out the backfield. So Aaron Jones can do a little bit of everything. He can get passing touchdowns and get rushing touchdowns. So you just have to, whatever you feel is the more comfortable outcome or the more comfortable situation for you as a running back choice, that's the one that you really have to go with. Uh, for wide receivers, there's Tyreek Hill. Uh, there's, of course, Devontae Adams. There is A.J. Brown, and those are really your top three guys that you have to look at. Um, As you know, uh, and there's also Emmanuel Sanders. You can look at him as well. Top four. So what are you really expecting out of the top two? Because A.J. Brown can be a little bit iffy because you don't really know how many touches he's going to acquire. Let's look at his game log real quick. Yeah, he had two fantasy points last week. And he hasn't had any game above really three since uh, the game against Houston in the regular season where he had 20 fantasy points. So you kind of just have to pick your, you know, pick your poison because you don't really know exactly how it's going to play out. In the playoffs, it does not seem like passing has been the has been the key for them. And then, of course, you know, teams are locking locking in on him because he is their number one receiving threat. So you just have to take that into consideration. But, you know, good players make big plays. So if you feel confident in him to make a big play, you know, pick him up. And then, of course, you know, Tyreek Hill is a game buster, a speed demon. You should look to him to get at least one of the touchdowns. That, you know, he had some big drops last week and it didn't look good for him as far as his stat line goes, but he was targeted four times. He's been targeted five. He's been targeted at least five times in the last three games. So, you know, he'll be looked at to some degree and, you know, the deep ball will always be the the preferred way that he scores. And then, of course, the real juggernaut of the group is Devontae Adams as far as the receiving goes. Uh, 32 points last week, two touchdowns. He is your bell cow in the receiving and the wide receiver slot. And then, of course, tight end, you can have your pick. Uh, Travis Kelsey or George Kittle is really what it is. Whoever, you know, they both are kind of their number one options on both teams. And you can just pick your fill. There's really no, you can't really go wrong with either one of those two. It's just whoever is going to have the bigger game. We'll have the bigger game at the end of the day. So those are your guys. So I would say Patrick Mahomes, Devontae Adams, Derrick Henry or Aaron Jones, take your pick. And then, uh, of course, Travis Kelsey or George Kittle, take your pick. And those guys are the probably the top dogs where all the money is going to be spent this weekend. And f- daily fantasy, so your fan duels, your draft kings, your monkey knife fights if you're into if you're really into some stuff that's a new one so coming up after this break we're going to talk about some not really sleepers but more penny pinchers and saving a little bit more saving a little bit more of that bread more of the chicken as marshawn lynch would say and that's coming up Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. All right, so let's dive right back into it. We were talking about the the bigger fantasy point performers that could be somebody that you want to spend your big dollars at last time and now we're going to get into the the more the more number crunching you know money saving position so let's look at uh let's look at the flex because that can be kind of a tricky situation or where to 
where to save your save your dollars at. And you can have anybody here in the flex tight ends, wide receivers, running backs. You can look at anywhere. So you may want to look at LaShawn McCoy as a flex spot just because, uh, you know, he doesn't always score per se, but he definitely does see some, some touches and that can be really, he can be a big piece. He knows big, he likes big games and whenever he goes up against a big game opponent, he typically performs pretty well. So we're just going to have to wait and see what he does this week. But I'd say LaShawn McCoy is a good look at, um, like I know he's a bit older and he's not what he used to be, but there's something about guys who have been in the league for a little while who understand big moments and when you need to have a big time play, sometimes they can really play above and beyond what they have been in the regular season. And that can be really valuable to to teams. And that's why I'm going to segue that into Emmanuel Sanders. Emmanuel Sanders has been known for clutch plays and being able to make something out of nothing and be able to really get stuff going. I know that he only had like two targets last game against the Vikings, but the Vikings, that game was a bit weird as far as offensive, uh, just the offensive numbers. You can really... Didn't need Emmanuel Sanders for that game by the time it was all said and done. So in reality, you know, you just move on and take what you can with that game. But know that Emmanuel Sanders is a big time wide receiver threat for them and can be. Uh, he hasn't had a really big productive game since the Saints game. But we can just wait and see and look what happens because big guys make big plays. And Emmanuel Sanders is... Not their number one target, but he's a guy that's been there before and knows how to handle his business. And you may want to spend a little, like, you know, a little money on him. So some guys that really might have some big turnout is uh, Mostert for San Francisco. I know I'm kind of going through the San Francisco list right now. But uh, he, as running back, he can really be explosive. He's super fast. And he can really be a barn burner. He didn't have the the best game last week because he got a little bit hurt in the middle of it. But it doesn't seem like that will take away his touches coming up. Uh, so him and, of course, uh, Tevin Coleman will be sharing a bit of carries throughout that game. And you just really have to pick which one you want, in my opinion. You never Because they both are probably going to get a nice equal amount of carries unless one of them just is really dominating the game and never really know what can happen out of that. Um, anybody really lower than that, you just are taking some heavy risks. So Chris, Corey Davis is a, is a risk only because he doesn't, when he does touch the ball and when he does score, it is, it still doesn't come with a lot of point value. So, his highest point value in the last four games has been seven. And really, he has, it's been a number of games since Buffalo, uh, or let me say since the Chargers, he hasn't had a game above seven since that game against Houston. So in reality, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. He's had ten games where he hasn't seen ten fantasy points. That's not, it's not good. Granted, this is not uh, PPR. This is uh, no points per reception. So he's not getting any of those points per receptions. But he, if he doesn't see the end zone, he might be a stay away. So you don't really know exactly what you're going to get with that. You probably have a better chance going with someone like A.J. Brown because of his potential of getting more points than that. And then, of course, you have uh, McCole Hartman who I'm interested in just because uh everything kind of warrants if he can get in the end zone, but he's a real big speed threat. And when you have some Tyreek Hill on the opposite side, he takes so much attention away. And so does Travis Kelsey. So other guys get involved in other ways. And it would be interesting to see if he can get going and make a big play down in the field for that team. Uh You don't really have much 
uh, fantasy value out of the tight ends unless you take the the top two. But then, of course, there's Jimmy Graham. Now, Jimmy Graham had a big game, had a big play last week. I wouldn't say he had a big game, but he had a big play to seal the game last week against the Seahawks. And sometimes you can take those type of things uh, into the next game with momentum. So he had four targets last week, uh, almost 50 yards receiving. So you know, you take that as you will if you feel like you want to spend money in more in more important places or do you want to put him out of the flex because you don't really trust anybody else. You know, that might be a good play because Jimmy Graham is a starting tight end, so he might get some more looks. But we all know who are the breadwinners in that offense, which are Devontae Adams and, of course, uh, Aaron Jones. So you just have to take... Take that with what you will, but if you're trying to save some money to maybe you can kind of ball out on Patrick Mahomes and then maybe Derrick Henry, you can definitely put in uh, Jimmy Graham as your flex and save some money and still probably get a good tight end, and that could just be your that could be your three headed dragon right there. So that's really all you see out of everybody else as far as really really interesting people to save some money on because everybody else is just kind of too situational. Like Adam Humphreys is a bit too situational and you know, his health is a concern a bit. Um, You don't really know about Dion Lewis just because of just how they've played in recent time. Uh, He hasn't seen a lot of production in the last two games in the, in just, you never really know. So in fact, he didn't play at all last week. So, he didn't get any fantasy stats, and you don't know if he's going to be able to play. And he's usually a good complimentary back for them. So if he does come out and play, it'd be amazing. Just because it would make their the Tennessee offense a bit more dynamic and have a little bit more to play. And then you can talk about Jamal Williams. He's he's kind of like the the glue guy around. He doesn't do a lot of big play stats but he'll touch the ball a lot and he might be able to make some big plays for their team but as fantasy wise he may not he may not do much for you so those are kind of some some stay aways I wouldn't really look too deep into those guys as much as anybody else and you know I would say just on the Green Bay wide receiver core aspect sometimes somebody's gonna have a big game but it's just you don't know if it's Vantez Scantling you don't know if it's going to be Geronimo Allison. Uh, you just don't know. So it's typically I, I stay away from guys who are not named Devontae Adams on the on the wide receiver core for them. So that's basically it on that. I don't really uh, really know where else to go for that, to be honest. And I guess you can look at quarterback, not really saving a lot of money, but I'm still really interested in the the. Uh, Tannehill pick just because he might he might have a chance here to to really cement himself as a guy that a lot of people have just seen him as a uh, as a feeder to Derrick Henry he hasn't really done much in the passing game which is true and that's a fair criticism but he may try to look to to air it out every now and again a little bit more than he has in past two playoff games just to keep the Chiefs honest and not just stack the box against Derrick Henry so they can continue to feed Derrick Henry. But we're going to take another quick break and we're going to come back and we're going to talk about some general NFL big news. So some Odell stuff, uh, the Luke Keekley retirement and much more. That's coming up. Are you looking to get your college football fix? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? The GSMC College Football Podcast is your ticket to all things college football. Join us as we talk college football from the national championship, the college rivalries, the bowl game, to the Heisman Trophy, to which conference is the best. We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, the Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. Download the GSMC College Football Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. All 
right, so coming back into the break, we were just now finishing up just some fantasy players to look at for the weekend, and now just some general NFL news and topics that have come up in the past week. Uh, first one that we're going to kind of get into is Larry Fitzgerald said he's coming back for his 17th NFL season. Uh, Larry Legend, he is... As consistent as they come, he had like 800 yards last year, which when you look at the grand scheme of that uh, that team down there in Arizona, you know, that's not too bad. And, you know, Kyler Murray came, came a little bit into his own, and he started to figure some things out. And I think Larry Fitzgerald sees a lot of potential uh, with that young man there playing quarterback. Uh, as far as the fantasy aspect, you don't... You know what you're getting with Larry Fitzgerald. If he can stay, if he's healthy, he can get you what he got you last year. And honestly, last year might be a low number if they can really figure some stuff out on offense with uh, Kingsbury and uh, figure some, figure out how to utilize not only Kyler Murray's speed as a runner, but just his be able to design an offense that can make things better for him. And then if they can. Uh, Really, really use the tandem that, you know, uh, David Johnson, if he can come back healthy. And of course, uh, with Kerry, uh, with Kenyon Drake, they can really make some noise, uh, as far as the regular season next year. And then maybe they can get some, get some good fancy production out of their guys. So, you know, uh, Christian Kirk or Captain Kirk, whatever you like to call him, he might be a good option to look at as well as the second receiver in that group, if you will need a wide receiver number two. Uh, I remember a few years ago, John Brown had some pretty good success over there, and now he's looking great for the Buffalo Bills. So uh, Larry Legend coming back one more year. Uh, you know, you wonder when he is going to hang it up, but I guess nothing, he's not really been slowed down. The way he plays the game of football, he doesn't take a lot of punishment. And he just seems like a just a, like a savvy veteran that just knows how to keep his body in good shape, knows where he wants to be, uh, how to get to his spots. He doesn't really take – he's not really a deep threat. Never has been a super deep threat beforehand, but he's not – he's more of a procession guy. And he just knows how to route run really well and has re- retained that ability. And it makes you think that, you know, there's some guys that retired – like a Ocho Cinco, like a, 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 you know, like someone like him, right? Uh, and, you know, he's tried to get back in the league a couple times, but just really hasn't worked out. But when you see guys, he trains guys, and you see them do workout videos and stuff, you're like, oh, wow, they still may have it. And really it's all about route running and just, you know, technique. Their guys' technique are so good that they can still play at certain levels and, you know, be able to – display stuff at a high level and they just their knowledge of the game so Larry Fitzgerald is just a knowledgeable player and able to really shift the shift his weight around and really do some things with his feet that a lot of wide receivers still struggle with and you know you lose the speed you lose the quickness to some degree as you get older but the technique always stays so uh Larry Legend 17 season coming up uh Antonio Gates retiring and i'll be completely honest i thought he retired last year so um he hasn't seen the field as much hunter henry has kind of taken taken the throne as the number one wide or the number one tight end on the chargers and antonio gates retires as a charger now in his heyday he was amazing he was mr reliable he was able to catch all different types of stuff i remember watching him play with vincent jackson uh, before he got traded to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. That guy, those two were just deadly combinations back in the day. But uh, congrats to on a good career. I don't know if he's a Hall of Famer. He Well, yeah, he's a Hall of Famer. But I don't know if he's first ballot. You know, he was the he was one of the first guys I remember that would get the, the classic uh, tight end, but he played basketball in college sort of guy. So... He is, uh, he's definitely changed. He helped revolutionize the tight end position, uh, in the modern 2000s and really 
really made it what it is today as a as a position that can kind of do it all swiss army knife uh so you know more hats off to him congratulations on retirement to him uh another retirement that i'm not is a little bit bitter, bittersweet for the nfl is luke keekley luke keekley sent out a message a few days ago saying that he is going to be retiring from the nfl because he does not believe that he can play at the level he would like to and I think he's alluding to his health because he's had a, a number amount of concussions in his NFL career. He's only 28 or 29, so he's actually fairly young. So this is weird just to know, like, for one, that he was that young still playing. I, like, I felt like he's been in the league for, like, 15 years at this point. And I've watched him every year, at least twice, because he plays the Saints twice. And, you know, he's just, he's been the one of the best linebackers if not the best linebacker in the national football league really since his second season in the nfl like he's just super smart the quarterback of the defense he's a guy that really really just knew the game and there was really nothing you could say to him he was just respected across the league everybody knew what he was about and they knew that when it was coming to game planning against him he was the he was a guy that you had to make sure you stayed in film and watched him because he was going to do something in that game that was going to either make you pay or he was going to change some dynamic of the game because he's just that good. So to see him walk away from the game at at a semi young age, you know, at a younger age than you would expect people to walk away from the game is really tough and I hope that his health is is going to be better for it and I'm just really I'm really curious to see what exactly what what's been going on with him besides just the what we know as the public cuz I'm sure there was some there might be some private stuff going on with him that he that he hasn't really brought out to the public eye yet that has to do with his health and him being concerned about his ability to play the football game cuz you know, the season ended a, a few weeks ago, and it seems like this this decision, he might have been mulling over this over the past few weeks rather than just really coming out of the blue. And I know it's kind of weird timing as the the Panthers' new head coach and new uh, offensive coordinator has been hired, but I don't think that had really anything to do with that. And then finally, of course, the national championship game LSU won against Clemson. Uh, Odell was out there and he was doing, he was doing a lot. So the first report, as this thing has kind of escalated a bit, was that he was giving out $100 bills to the LSU players after the win on the field and then he was in the locker room and he was just cutting up, having a good time. But, you know, the NCAA, you can't just be giving players money like that, especially not on live TV where they can, everybody can see you. So, uh, they've been in discussions about that whole ordeal first. And then this morning, uh, it was, uh, or Thursday morning, we got news of the New Orleans Police Department has set out a warrant of arrest for Oda Buckham Jr. for, uh, battery somewhat. So there was that viral video that went out that, he uh, slapped the backside of a cop when he was talking to one of the LSU players. And there's been a lot of controversy between all of that situation just for the, the cop being in there. And, you know, it's a championship game. And just the whole dynamic on that, it's just a weird situation. And it's just interesting to see that Odell's in the middle of all of this. So we'll just have to wait and see what exactly comes out of this. But... uh it just seems a bit weird, in my opinion. I don't think, I think the, the charge is weird. I think the, the fact that the NCAA is kind of cracking down on this, on this incident in itself with the money thing is weird. It just seems very weird and really, uh, kind of unnecessary. It took, it's taken a lot of the fun away from the fact that LSU won that national title in like a Cinderella story. And now this whole story is kind of becoming a whole thing. And it's kind of overshadowing the fact that they beat seven. They beat seven top ten ranked teams and won the national title. 
and went undefeated throughout the whole season. And I just think that that's just weird that that's not still the story. But we're going to take another break and we're going to get into some Dynasty League stuff to, to end the podcast off on a better note. That's coming up. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. All right, so we were talking about some general news earlier, and now we're going to kind of settle down and get this podcast under wraps with some Dynasty League talk. So Dynasty Leagues are a big thing, and they become more and more relevant as the years go by because it just seems like a GM type of role. So you really get more control over the just your team and how you do season to season. You can trade draft picks and they make sense. So if you're not doing too well, you can keep on keeping on, so to speak. So CBS has placed out their fantasy football dynasty rankings and it's been updated weeks, like month to month. So here we have the top five, which is Christian McCaffrey, Saquon Barkley, Ezekiel Elliott, Michael Thomas, Dalvin Cook, and then the top, the six and below, I guess, is Alvin Kamara, Nick Chubb, DeAndre Hopkins, Joe Mixon at nine, and Josh Jacobs at ten, which is very intriguing. Uh, as you can hear, there is no Derrick Henry in sight. So, that's kind of interesting in my opinion, as I would think that Derrick Henry would have had a little bit more draft stock going on into into the rest of the season and looking into next season just because of this fantasy run. But uh, the more you really think about it, you have to keep things in perspective of how fantasy football works. Now, he may not be the most valuable running back. He may not be, he may not be the most valuable running back in fantasy terms. So he, as far as team necessary, he's the most valuable player in the NFL, aside from Pat Mahomes in the playoffs right now. And as far as he might be the best running back in the league, however, the best fantasy player or the best football player, he is not, he's not doing what you need in fantasy right now, especially if you're like in a PPR league. So what his skill set is capable of doing, aside from someone like Christian McCaffrey's, are just too different. But does that mean he should be ranked 15th? I'm not too sure. Uh, they have Leonard Fournette ranked ahead of him at 14. That can kind of be a, a toss-up. They have Aaron Jones at 16, which I think is a bit weird as well. But, you know, these are the top... They're in the top 20 players drafted. So clearly they still have high value. They're just not the highest of the high. And you can see uh, Patrick Mahomes on this list is ranked 21. And that's the first quarterback looked at, uh, just on this list in general. And, uh, let's see, when's the, the next one? Um, doing some, some looking. I don't think there's one really seen after that. I would think, I would believe it's Lamar, but I don't see him on the list just yet. So, uh, I saw Josh Allen up here. So it, uh, Lamar is 36th and, Sean Jackson's 35. So those are the, the next two quarterbacks taken off the, in the dynasty owners list. So that means that, you know, quarterbacks are still getting highly valued if you have the dual threat capabilities now. So that's interesting to take away. So what does this mean? Cause as we can see in the top five, so let's get back to the top five that Michael Thomas is in there, which is, just wildly fascinating just because of the 
his production as a player is kind of has been unparalleled. It's not kind of, it has been. And, you know, he doesn't score a lot of touchdowns, doesn't get in the end zone as much as you would you would think a number one wide receiver would. He still gets in there good enough, but he's just not in the he's not scoring touchdown after touchdown after touchdown. But the what he does in between the in between the numbers and in between the the goal lines and his just just consistency of being able to catch balls and being open and being in the right position. His route running, the most underrated portion of his game, in my opinion, because he's not super fast, but he has a quickness of turning and able to move his body and just be able to shield people off and catch footballs are just really something that people don't think about too much. Um, the Ezekiel Elliott thing is weird to me because I don't think he, I don't believe he was a top five back. Honestly, if it was me, I would switch Nick Chubb and Ezekiel Elliott. Or I would move Dalvin Cook up and I'd put uh, Dalvin Cook at number three, Michael Thomas four. And then I'd put, uh, I would put Nick Chubb fifth. And not to say that Ezekiel Elliott is a bad football player. I just don't know what exactly why he's ranked third when you can really think about it. There's just so many changes going on in the Cowboys organization as far as the head coach. And you really don't know exactly what type of scheme they're going to be running. And he had an off year comparatively, like off for his, his standards he set in the past two years. Uh, so when you really look at it from that grand scheme of things, uh, we know what, why Saquon is ranked second. And that's just based off of his just overall potential of being the best running back in the league. And his only year two was kind of a drop off. He did get hurt a few games and, you know, Christian McCaffrey was the best fantasy player in the world last year. And his numbers are just otherworldly ridiculous. And, the only person that really could compare to is Lamar Jackson. He's a quarterback. So you really don't, really don't put those two in the same conversation. So what is that really? This list is telling me that running backs are still going to be a, at a premium because the for there's only two, two players in the top 10 who are not running backs. And those are your two best wide receivers in the league, which are Michael Thomas and DeAndre Hopkins. So, um, and it's really weird that Joe Mixon is nine to me just because of he did not have the best season. However, his value as a player, because uh, we all predict that Joe Burrow will be in a Cincinnati Bengals uniform, will be really interesting to see. And I think that his value will skyrocket. And I think people will look to pick him up more in uh, standard leagues, not dynasty leagues. Uh, at higher rounds than they did last time because they they picked him up around the near the tail end of the first round if you had really good faith in the Bengals but a lot of there's a lot of reports of the Bengals not being good this season and that tended up being true so you just have to really pick and choose what you really believe and you just got to stay up on your fantasy football news and be aware of what's happening around the league because you can't always go off of just raw numbers. You have to look at the whole grand scheme of things. You have to look at the draft. You have to look at free agency signings. You have to look at what changes in the landscape of the league. So that's really all that it is. So like say, for example, I'm a guy who's looking at some low value guys that you can maybe be able to pick up and who may be able to have a really interesting year. Someone like DJ Moore for Carolina. I had him this year and he was he was very good for what he was doing in PPR. He was very good and he was a kind of a wide receiver two, kind of borderline wide receiver one to start. But, you know, he didn't always get in the end zone and he also had direct competition his own running mate in Samuels, right? So you have to take those type of things in perspective and they got a new offense coordinator, new head coach. And we don't know exactly what's going to happen with Cam Newton, if he's going to be the starter next year, if he's going to even be in Carolina. So you can't just go off the idea that, okay, DJ Moore had a good production because uh, people were focusing on Christian McCaffrey so much that when they got in the passing game, it was really up to 
no one really was covering him as hard. Or you can say the same thing about Samuels. But it's just going to be a different environment now. We don't really know exactly what Carolina's plan is. So I wouldn't look to drafting him just yet until you really go through some mocks and see what other people are thinking. Because I don't think he'll be a super high pick. And you might be able to get some value from him. And you still don't really know exactly what how he's going to be in the offense. And I will look, instead of looking at someone like him, I'll look at someone like Devontae Parker, who, honestly, his draft stock might have even surged a bit just because of how that team is starting to look at the end of the season. And the contract extension looked nice, and he played well while getting the extension. So that looks something to to really monitor. But I'm going to wrap it up here. Uh, thank you for listening to the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast, hosted by the GSMC Podcast Network. I would encourage you to please like and review about the podcast on any platform that you choose to listen to it. And don't forget to follow us on our social media, which is Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day, a good AFC, NFC Championship weekend, and have a good time watching all those games just as i will play fantasy hope you win all the earnings and if you lose you know it's better luck next time goodbye you've been listening to the golden state media concepts fantasy football podcast part of the golden state media concepts podcast network you can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com download our podcast on itunes stitcher soundcloud and google play just type in gsmc to find all the shows from the golden state media concepts podcast network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program